Uh, General Hotel uh, will speak tonight on Afghanistan, the lessons learned. He is uniquely qualified. Uh, he first landed in Afghanistan shortly after 9-11 by parachute. He was uh, uh, at the time uh, commanding the Army Ranger Force that dropped into Kandahar in October of 2001 and cleared the way for a Marine base called Camp Rhino. Uh, later, he served as deputy commander of the 82nd Airborne Division in Afghanistan. He rose through the ranks. He became commander of the U.S. Special Operations Command in 2014. And after two, two years later, he became the commander of the U.S. Central Command, uh, which oversees operations throughout the Middle East, including Afghanistan. So he got to see the country from a lot of vantage points within the military through his retirement in 2019. Um, he, uh, he's a man you can see from his uh, record who take, takes on the tough challenges as a way of life. <clears throat> and in that spirit, uh, he uh, asked us for, for questions in advance and, and uh, we, we came up with some. Um, uh, Robbie Harris, uh, asked him a question about uh, why uh, were we unsuccessful in Afghanistan over 20 years? What could have been done differently? Uh, Al Berkeley, one of our trustees, asked him, uh, you say that it was a mistake to depart Afghanistan without leaving a residual force behind. How could that have been accomplished? Um, the, Al had a second question, which is even a better follow-up in a way. <laughs> what are the hard questions you want us to ask? And finally, my question was, um, what was the problem in Afghanistan that American counterterrorism focuses on killing the bad guys and too little on achieving a stable political outcome? So uh, those are the questions. Now, the general uh, right now is um, the head of the business executives for uh, national security um, and uh, an important uh, organization. Um, and he's also the uh, chairman of the uh, Combating Terrorism Center in, um, at, at West Point, which produces some of the very best writing on uh, counterterrorism issues. Enough questions. General, the floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Roy. It's, it's great to be with you um, and, uh, and all of your, all of your guests uh, uh, this evening. Uh, I've had an opportunity to talk to a number of kind of local councils on foreign relations around the country, including my hometown up in Boston. I'm going down to Dallas in a couple of weeks, and of course, Baltimore tonight, and a couple of others along the way. So I really enjoy these discussions, and I'm very grateful that you all have uh, invited me to join you um, this evening. And I'm especially grateful to uh, Al Berkeley. Al, as probably many of you know, is a director at Business Executives for National Security, a longtime member and, and a good friend and a, and a great supporter of me and my role as the president and CEO. So Al, thanks, uh, thanks so much for this. Um, so uh, Roy, as you highlighted here, I mean, uh, like, like many Americans, um, I, I am one of those that has a lot of experience in, in Afghanistan and had the opportunity to see it through, through, a, uh, through a, a variety of lenses from you know, the, our very first operations in, in the middle of October of 2001, uh, when we were really stepping very cautiously into this country that we did not know anything about, literally knew nothing about, and did not have many resources uh, on the ground, certainly, and, and or in the air to help us understand it better. And we really had to learn a little bit the hard way. And of course, I uh, was able to <clears throat> return a number of times, as, uh, as you pointed out, with the 82nd Airborne Division, where I was actually in the, in the eastern part of the country. And uh, really responsible for uh, orchestrating what uh, was more of a counterinsurgency campaign at the time that we were waging, and then returned uh, in my role at the uh, Joint Special Operations Command, where uh, as both uh, the Deputy Admiral McRaven and later as the commander, where we actually were prosecuting uh, a majority of the uh, of the uh, counter counterterrorism operations throughout the country. And, and then of course saw it as the SOCOM commander and the CENTCOM commander as, the, as kind of the four-star commanders that are overseeing that effort. So it's, it was, it's a unique uh, view that I have on this. Uh, I, I, I would just share up front with you. I, I, I think the Afghan people are good. I think they deserved, uh, they deserve better than they got 
from not only from their own country, but from us and from the from the allies that were there for a long time. Uh, you know, I think reasonable people can agree or disagree on whether we needed to stay in Afghanistan, but I think largely everyone can agree that the way we departed was not uh, was not the was not the was not in our interests, and certainly wasn't in the interests of the of the Afghan people. But we can certainly talk more about that uh, in, in when we get to the questions and answers. And I'm happy to <clears throat> happy to dive more into that. One of the questions that uh, Robbie posed, uh, and uh, I appreciate appreciate this question, is, you know, we you know this is a this is a country where we did serve for nearly 20 years. So why did this? Why did why did we fail here, and uh, and what could have been done differently? Um, I, I, I I've, this is something I've thought about a lot. Uh, I actually continue to think about a lot. My thinking on this does evolve. I would share uh, really three things with you that uh, that really continue to come to my top top of my mind as I think about our our failure in Afghanistan. First and foremost is we did have a strategy and resources mis mismatch throughout our throughout our time in Afghanistan. Um, as 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 uh, as you all have probably heard in your own reading that uh, you know we we went there in 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 2001. Uh, we were really focused on uh, on getting the Taliban out of power and displacing the. Um, the uh, uh, the Al Qaeda, they're destroying them and and you know causing them to to break up and uh, and preventing them from from being the threat that they were and and we largely accomplished that in the first couple months uh, and then we began to wander and our strategy began to wander and that actually happened over a long period of time and of course as we as administration changed as uh, as commanders on the ground changed as uh, national priorities changed uh, so did our strategy and. So so we did have a, we did have a, I think a, a, a an unclear strategy for what we really wanted to achieve in Afghanistan. We went from beating Al Qaeda to trying to do counterinsurgency to uh, to more of a uh, of a uh, counterterrorism focus to really this advise and assist and helping the Afghan forces uh, stand up on their own. And all of that took place over the course of 20 years. And I think it was an uneven strategy. At the same time, I also think we had a mismatch in our in our resources, and I don't necessarily mean our military resources. There was a period when we did have a good representation from the Department of State, from other agencies of our government uh, on the ground, and they were all kind of giving together. My time when I was there at the 82nd in the 2007-2008 period, I think represented the, the, the kind of the high point of this, where we had things like provincial reconstruction teams. We had heavy focus by USAID on the ground. Uh, we had a variety of other uh, instruments of our national power to include things like the Department of Agriculture that were, that were helping in this. But that was, that was not sustainable over time. And so what it had the effect of doing was over-militarizing our approach to uh, to uh, to Afghanistan. So, the what what should have what what should more properly have been a, a strategy that reflected all elements of national power became very heavily militarized and uh, and uh, and ultimately uh, the military could not be the could not be the final solution in Afghanistan. So that's that's a first of kind of a lengthy reasons here. I, I think also we. Um, underestimated the ability to overcome uh, the culture of corruption in, in Afghanistan. Um, um, Roy, I know you've written on, on Afghanistan, so you certainly understand a lot about this, uh, about this country. And, uh, you know, it, it might interest uh, some, of, uh, some of our audience to, to appreciate that, you know, in the 1960s, this was actually a fairly modern country. And it was one of the leading exporters of, of dried fruits. It had, uh, it had uh, I mean, we, we invested lots of money in this country to try to, to get it on its uh, feet. And it was, it was very, very progressive uh, country for us uh, in that time. And, but of course it fell very, very precipitously um, you know, in the in the in the years leading up to the Soviet invasion, and then certainly in the in the aftermath of that, and the destruction and the rise of tribal powers and other things in this country, uh, and really gave way to a to a ingrained level of corruption that we were unable to to change despite a lot of efforts. Our former national security advisor, H.R. McMaster, and a 
earlier uh, position he had actually led a task force on uh, on the ground to begin to get after this. And there were a lot of efforts to try to address this, but ultimately uh, we were we were unsuccessful in doing this. And the level of corruption uh, that was endemic in this government that continued up through the Ghani government really worked to undermine the confidence of Afghan forces in their own government. So when the United States in February of 2020 makes an agreement with the Taliban, for many, the writing is on the wall. Uh, they don't trust their own government and, and, and the things begin to unravel slowly and then rapidly as we saw at the end of this. So uh, <clears throat> I think we did, we did underestimate, I think the, the impact of that and, and, the, and the precipitous uh, impact that that had on security in Afghanistan. I think the third thing I would just highlight to you is that um, you know there were a variety of missed opportunities I think for us to to off ramp and move this in different directions, and I would share one or two with you. First was as perhaps as early as December of 2001, after we had been spectacularly successful in displacing the. Uh, uh, the uh, Taliban from power, uh, largely largely beaten and driven driven out, uh, certainly out of power, uh, and uh, and Al Qaeda chased and cornered in the Tora Bora region. Uh, this, I think, was an opportunity to to go in a different direction. Um, uh, I, I, you know, in hindsight, is of course, is always 2020 in this. But in this time, it, there was evidence that the Taliban was wanting to talk to us, was wanting to talk to the United States and Western powers to begin to move the country back. Uh, we we ch we chose a different direction, and I'm, you know, again, I, I it's it's difficult for me to to troubleshoot all of that. I, I'm not, I wasn't the person in the room making the decisions on that, but it is where we where we went, and then we and then we we kind of wandered into this counterinsurgency period that took place. I think we had other opportunities as well. I think in, in 2011, when, uh, when we killed uh, bin Laden, this is, was a milestone event. It was an opportunity to, to go in a different direction here uh, with that. And, and again, we, we, we didn't. We chose to continue to, to really focus on, on military efforts against the, uh, against the, against the Taliban. So there, there were some opportunities along the way, I think, to, to take a different approach on this. Uh, resolving Afghanistan was always going to be a difficult challenge uh, under any circumstances, but I, I do think there were some opportunities um, here with, uh, uh, with that. You know, as I, as, I, as I would just kind of finish up by, you know, I, I'm sure there's other reasons and we can probably get into more as we kind of get into the discussion here. But let me, let me finish up by, by addressing uh, Roy's Roy's question here about you know kind of the lessons learned on 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 on, on, ter on, on terrorism operations after 20 years in Afghanistan, Iraq, Syria, and other things. You know, I, first and foremost, I, I think we I think we we learned uh, that in order to address these terrorist networks, particularly the ones we're dealing with right now, they require constant pressure. Um, and we, you know, there, there has to, we have to continue to, to apply pressure on these networks. Maybe not at the same level of intensity all the time, but uh, these, these organizations grow in areas where we don't pay attention, where we don't apply a pressure, where we don't have our partners uh, doing the same, and they will, they will erupt. And all of the conditions that give rise to organizations like this are ever present. Uh, in these countries of Afghanistan, Iraq, Syria, these underlying issues that give rise to the discontent that leads to terrorist organizations standing up, all, all, all reside. And, and, and so unless we, unless we address these, and this really is my second point on uh, terms of, less, of the lessons learned, is that we have, to, we have to do better at addressing the underlying causes of, uh, of terrorism. Uh, and uh, you know, in some cases, those are things that we can address and other things, there are things we have to address with our, with our, uh, with our partners on the ground and with our other allies who have shared interests in these areas. But we we were we were not effective at, at addressing the underlying issues. And, and I think as you look at places like Afghanistan, Iraq, 
uh, Syria to some extent, um, uh, we do see a, a lot of the underlying issues and currents that run through this region are, are as present today as they were 20 plus years ago when we, when we first you know, stepped in there in a, in a major way. I think the third thing that we really learned out of this is the importance of a networked approach. I think if there is a really positive aspect that comes out of our experience in Afghanistan and Iraq is that it really did drive our, our national security interagency together. Uh, the Department of Defense, the intelligence community, the law enforcement community, and in particular the, you know, the FBI, uh, the Department of State, uh, USAID, uh, a variety of other organ customs and border protection, a variety of other organizations really came together and we developed a really, uh, a really deep and, uh, and abiding relationships that have largely kept our country safe for the time since. Um, and, uh, you know, so I, as, as General McChrystal, who, you know, is a, is, is a mentor and role model for me and somebody I've worked for often, often told us, you know, in order to defeat a network, you have to have a network. And so this idea of a networked approach or bringing all capabilities uh, to bear uh, against, uh, against, these, against another network really, I think, is a very key, uh, key lesson learned out of, out of this approach. I would just share uh, a, a fourth and final one for you, and it is the notion of partnership. And, uh, you know, I think as you look at our experience in Afghanistan, you can see good examples and poor examples of how we partner. I, my, my personal uh, experience was very heavily with the Afghan Special Operations Forces. I think they were quite capable, particularly in a tactical sense. They were not great planners. They were not great strategists, uh, but they were good fighters. And with, with proper enablement, they were, they were quite they were quite they were quite effective in terms of what the, uh, what what they were being asked to do on the ground. Again, you might ask, well, why didn't they fight at the end? Well, the reason they didn't fight at the end is because they they saw the writing on the wall and they were not going to fight for for a uh, for a for a, uh, an Afghan regime that was that was left in place that was corrupt and was not looking out for their own interests. Um, so I think we 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 learned we learned a lot out of that. Uh, I, I had the opportunity, to, as, as uh, was mentioned, to lead our campaign in, in Iraq and Syria against ISIS, and we actually modified our approach to partnership there. When we, when we stepped into that really difficult situation in 2014, uh, we did not try to recreate partners in our own image. Uh, we took them as they were. The, Af the Iraqi army was terribly beat up, and we so we focused on rebuilding them, but we didn't try to reorganize them. We didn't try to change their institutions. We just tried to get them back on their feet, get good leaders in place, and give them the necessary tools and training so they could they could get back out there and uh, and and take on uh, take on ISIS. And they did a pretty good job uh, with that. In in Syria, we we basically partnered with a Kurdish led force that included Arab militias uh, that was quite effective. And again, we, they were a very unique organization. We did not try to over-organize them. Uh, we really focused on enabling them, uh, using the advantages that were inherent in their, in their own organization and structure, and really brought that to bear. So we learned a lot about how we more effectively partner with, uh, with, uh, with our you know, indigenous partners on the ground. I think we did a much better job of that uh, over time. And, and, and we, of course, this remains critical today in the environment in which we are now trying to preserve our influence against China and others. So um, <clears throat> that's a lot. I think I'll, I think I'll stop there and, and maybe we can move into more of a question and answer. And uh, I'm happy to talk about really whatever you wanna, whatever you wanna talk about. Over to you, Robbie. Thank you very much, Roy, and thank you, General. General, uh, I'm going to take the advantage of the uh, of the chair for a minute here. In <clears throat> your first comments tonight, you commented that the Afghanistan people are good people. Could you distinguish? Could you distinguish between the Afghanistan people and the Afghanistan leaders? Yeah, I, I mean, I, I think, um, yes, I, I, I would draw a little bit of a distinction between that. I mean, 
<clears throat> not every not every Afghan leader was a bad leader. Uh, I, I certainly had many opportunities to meet with military leaders and elected leaders that were members of parliament that were trying to do the right thing, were trying to be representative of their citizens, and were trying to move Afghanistan in the right direction. But the uh, the endemic issues uh, with uh, with corruption in the country, to which I, to which I do readily. Uh, acknowledge, you know, we contributed to in a, in a direct or indirect way with the amount of money that we pumped into this country over a relatively short period of time, I think contributed to this. And it did create a culture of, uh, of corruption here, particularly with some of the some of the elected leaders. Of course, I think everybody is aware <clears throat> that the situation we stepped into <clears throat> in uh, in in Afghanistan in 2001 was one where there were a you know a series of tribal leaders warlords um, who were you know nominally in charge of of different parts of the country and obviously were operating under you know corrupt practices and uh, and uh, and uh, and and approaches to uh, to their own governance and, and levels of security. I think there's pretty good examples uh, to look at in the history of this period, where uh, different different partners, different tribes, went went back and forth between which side they were actually supporting, uh, depending on how the winds were blowing and, and uh, where the where the money was coming from in terms of this. So there is a there is a level of uh, corruption in this. When you meet the Afghan people. Um, uh, I just, my, my experience in, in meeting with many of them, getting to know a lot of their soldiers, a lot of their military leaders, uh, they're, they're generous people. Uh, many of them, of course, the Pashtuns, uh, you know, operate under the Pashtun Wali code. They are incredibly welcoming of visitors to their homes, to their villages. Uh, they have a very unique uh, culture that allows them to <clears throat> forgive for trespasses on their, on their, in their areas. Uh, I was always amazed whenever we had uh, situations where there was collateral damage or we had caused uh, deaths or alleged to have caused deaths of Afghan civilians when we went out to make salacia payments. It was a, they had a way of, they had a cultural way of working through this. So I, I think it is a very deep um, and respectful culture there. I think the Afghan people are tired of what they're, uh, what they're, what they have been dealing with. And I think they, they deserve and want want stability. They took major advantage of the educational reforms that were taking place over the last 20 years to get their children and their, especially their young girls in the schools. They readily grabbed on to all of that stuff. They grabbed on to technology. Uh, they went from basically no phones to 3G in just a matter of years. Uh, when you look at a country like ours, and we did that over the course of you know a century or more, uh, frankly, and uh, so they, I mean, they're 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 very, they're very capable. They're, um, I think, good people at their at their heart, but they have been poorly served by by their leaders. I'm afraid. General, thank you. One of our <coughs> excuse me, one of our members commented on a comment you made early on this evening about how during their early early years in the war in Afghanistan, that there was truly an interagency approach uh, across the, the entire spectrum mm -hmm. of the US, US government. And somehow that defaulted over the years into a principally military approach. Fast forward now to the Biden administration's integrated deterrence approach. And there have been any number of criticisms, Wall Street Journal mm -hmm. principal among them, about the integrated deterrence and that integrated deterrence does not emphasize enough the military. Would you comment on that? Uh, this, this gets to the Biden administration integrated deterrence approach. Does it, does it overemphasize uh, the all of government approach and de-emphasize the military. Well, I, I don't I don't know. I you know I, I'm not in government right now, so I'm not in the room seeing that. But uh, you know, I guess my my observation on this would be that 
The idea behind integrated deterrence is really to bring all the capabilities of the United States, all of our instruments of power into, you know, kind of orchestration so we can create the greatest, the greatest effect that possible. I mean, um, if, uh, you know, if, I, I, and the military has a key role to play in this, but I do recognize that, uh, you know, in my, my way of thinking about this, and particularly as I've thought about it in my retirement is in many ways, the military is always going to be a supporting effort. You know, the act of going to war is a political, is a political act, as all of you know. It's a, it's a policy decision to do that. Um, and one of the instruments, of course, that's, that's key to that is, is the military. So it certainly plays a, a key role in that, but so does uh, diplomacy, so does our economic power, so does the power of our business community, so does all of the other uh, uh, you know, tools that we have within our, our repertoire that we can, we can bring to bear. So I, I think the key on this isn't so much who has dominance. I think the, the key on this is how do we orchestrate all all of these instruments we have to create the effects that we that we really want. I, I, I would share with you, I, I am a huge supporter of our diplomatic efforts, and I wish we would put more effort into this area. So as an example, when I when I stepped out of uh, stepped out of position as a CENTCOM commander back in uh, 2019, um, seven of the 18 countries in the region had a confirmed ambassador. Now, think about the message that that sends to the countries where we don't have a confirmed ambassador. And I'm not saying that to denigrate our charges or other diplomats that are out there. They are excellent. They are dedicated Americans that are trying to do the best that they can, but they do not carry the weight of an American ambassador that is, you know, selected by the by the president and confirmed by the Senate and really carries the full weight of the United States. And, and I'm not just, these aren't just, um, you know, countries that we're, we're unconcerned about. These are pretty major countries that, that are that were impacted by this. This is Jordan. This is the Emirates. Um, this is Saudi Arabia. Um, countries where we have that are very vestous in, in our interest and we have uh, we have not we did not we, we didn't put enough emphasis in it to even get people into these positions and I recognize that's not a that's not completely the the, the responsibility of the executive branch the, the Senate plays a big role in this as well but we have got to really bring our, our, our elements of power to bear and I think that's what that's what integrated deterrence is really is, is about. General, thank you very much. There's an interesting dialogue going on in the Q&A session now uh, about comparing Afghanistan to Vietnam. And let me just read a couple of them to you. Can you compare similarities of USA involvement in Afghanistan and Vietnam and how they inform how to treat future conflicts. Another person comments, is Afghanistan a Southwest version of Vietnam or do we find some ways to make new mistakes? Another person comments, I served in Vietnam when there was a draft. Should a military draft be reinstituted? And then lastly, one of our members asked this question. Let me, oh, here it is. Should a civilian versus a military officer be the Secretary of Defense? Uh, okay, there's a lot there. Uh, and uh, I'll, I'll try to address all those. So let me talk about the, the Vietnam-Afghan uh, comparison. I, um, you know, obviously I did not serve in, in Afghanistan and uh, or in uh, in Vietnam, so I, I don't really, I, I can only I can only compare this through my own uh, through my own uh, you know reading of history and my understanding of the war there. And I guess what I would take you back to is is you know one of the really important doctrines that was established out there in the wake of the Vietnam period was what we refer to as the Powell Doctrine, and uh, and it was it was it, you know it, it kind of grew out of the Reagan administration and and, and it was about 
that when we made the decision to go to war, uh, we did it with a very clear objective in mind, with an end state that we were trying to achieve, and uh, and and with the resources that we needed to be overwhelmingly successful. And I think when you look at both of these. Uh, both of these conflicts, I think we can see instances in here where we did not apply the lessons learned out of Vietnam and out of these, out of these well-crafted uh, doctrines that, uh, that came out of this, that were developed by guys like Casper Weinberger, by uh, Colin Powell, and, and a variety of others in the wake of this to make sure that we didn't stumble into, into long, um, seemingly endless, uh, endless campaigns. And so, you know, I, I, I think I take you back to my, my opening comments here. I think, you know, what you see in this is we, we seem to lack a strategy in terms of what we were trying to achieve with this. And I think this is common Common to, to both of these. I think uh, to some extent, both of these were counterinsurgencies. Um, democracies, in my estimation, don't do well in counterinsurgencies. We do better in, in desert shields, desert storms, where it is very quick. There is a very defined uh, peace. And while, uh, you know, we, we, you know, the difference, one of the differences in Afghanistan is that the military did enjoy the very, very strong support of the American people throughout, throughout our involvement there. Uh, but, but the patience that to deal with a, um, with a counterinsurgency, a long-term counterinsurgency is not, is not a characteristic of democracies in my view, especially our democracy. So, you know, I think I would just share those as, as maybe some compare and contrast uh, in terms of this, uh, you know, uh, I think uh, everybody, uh, you know, I'm certain some of the Vietnam veterans here have probably read some of the books by Harry Summers and others in the wake of uh, in the wake of Vietnam, and you know he recalls the story of when he met one of his uh, North Vietnamese uh, adversaries, you know, after the war, and uh, and and Colonel Summers says, "You we, we you never beat us." Um, you never beat us on the ground, and his and his and his, and, his re, and the response from the north is that that didn't matter. We own the time, we own the clock, and in many ways, the Taliban did the same on this. They just had to wait, and as we became impatient, as we tried to move towards negotiations without uh, really fully engaging the Afghan government in this, uh, the, the the sands of time were ticking faster. Uh, for them. And so I think there are some similarities and contrasts there. And, and those are a few I share with you. In terms of a draft, um, I, I don't know. I, I again, I, I am I am a product of the voluntary army. I came in and uh, I came on active duty in May of, uh, of 1980 when I graduated from West Point. And so I was a voluntary volunteer army at the time. We were early on in the volunteer army. It wasn't, it was certainly wasn't the great army that we have today or the great military that we have today. Uh, we had to learn out of that and a lot of investment and focus had to be had to be put into it. Uh, and I think we became a very proud military. Um, I think there are good arguments for why we might consider a draft. I am concerned about, uh, about the, the drifting that is occurring between the military and the American population, that there are less and less American citizens that serve. There are less and less American citizens that know people that serve. Um, and there are less and less institutions uh, uh, armories, installations, and other things out in our communities that uh, many of our citizens don't see the military. Uh, and so I think this is, this is, I think, a very strong argument for why we might want to have a draft. My, my personal view is, I, I think, frankly, the, as an American citizen, I think we would be better served by, by in, not necessarily investing in a draft, but investing in, in a program of national service for American uh, youth um, to do something for the country, whether it is serve in uniform, whether it is serve in law enforcement, whether it is do a variety, you know, Peace Corps, do a variety of other things that could be done that would compel people to national service. I, I like the idea of national service. I'm not yet sure that needs to translate into into a full-on draft, although I do see some of the 
uh, particular advantages of that. And I think we have to guard against creating a warrior class out there, uh, so to speak. I don't think that serves us well. I think our military does have to reflect the citizens that it serves. The last question about the Secretary of Defense. Um, I, I think this is an extraordinarily interesting one. I, I, was, the, I was the CENTCOM commander when uh, Jim Mattis was the Secretary of Defense. I worked for Jim Mattis when he was the commander of CENTCOM. I was one of his task force commanders. You know, I guess the the good thing about uh, about about being a combatant commander when you have a general like Mattis as a Secretary of Defense is that he understands the he understands the area in which you're operating. The bad the bad part of that is that uh, he understands the area in which you're <laughs> operating, uh, and so he's an expert on it. And uh, and that 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 was I'm not, 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 certainly not taking a dig at. Uh, at Secretary Mattis, somebody who I deeply re respect here, but um, uh, you know, the, the, I, I think this is. I think we put rules in place um, to make this a very, uh, a very unique decision to put uh, military officers into into the positions of uh, of, of Secretary of Defense, and um, I think the idea is to make sure that there is a very clean break between civilian control of the military and uniformed. Uh, leadership, and I think that's very important. I, I think both of the officers that we have seen, our our last couple of secretaries that fit this criteria, Secretary Mattis and and, and our current secretary uh, Lloyd Austin are are extraordinary Americans. I have the <laughs> utmost respect for for both of them, and I think they are doing. Uh, the jobs that they've been given in the in the best light that they can, in terms of this. Uh, but I, I I I do think it, it is in our interest that this is a an exception rather than a rule as we move forward. And uh, I think there I think there's a, a very well reason why we had a rule in place for uh, for people that be out of the military for to require uh, you know congressionally approved exceptions here for that. Um, and, I, and I say that and, and don't take anything away from the two officers that, that I've just mentioned here who are extraordinary, extraordinary role models to me. General, thank you very much. Regarding the national service uh, point that you made a few minutes ago, you probably saw, uh, and it was two or three weeks ago, uh, the statement by the three service secretaries about the big, big challenges they're facing today in recruitment. And there was an article just last week um, in a publication you probably don't read, Naval Institute Proceedings, in which the Commandant, <laughs> in which the Commandant of the Marine Corps, General Berger, talked at length in their article about the challenges the Marine Corps is facing today with recruitment. Uh, we, we, who knows, we'll go on to another subject, but we may be reaching a, a, a time in which there, there is a change. Uh, there, the, the dialogue is so rich um, let me go to, to on the Q&A. Um, here's one. If the Republicans win tonight, they will no doubt insist on hearings on how the Biden administration was responsible for, dis for the disastrous withdrawal from Afghanistan. What will they find? Were the bad decisions made attributable to poor political decisions by the government? Would decisions have been made different had the Trump administration been in power? Uh, <laughs> yeah, very interesting, uh, interesting question. Uh, you know, I, I would I just remind you, I, you know, a general is opining on political things or is always a little bit fraught. I, I guess what I would, what I, but it's a fair question, I think. And, and I would just ask you, because I think as I look back at the, I mean, a, uh, I think a, a good argument could be made that the, that the that the nail in the coffin, the final nail in the coffin, that really began to seal the fate for Afghanistan, really was the the agreement that was signed between the United States and the Taliban in um, in uh, in February or March of 2020, and that that put into and that uh, get that basically guaranteed that we would withdraw uh, all of our forces out of there in a, in a certain time period. And of course that occurred under the previous administration here. Um, uh, uh, so, I mean, that began to set in motion and that 
could the could the Biden administration have done something different? Yes, I think they could have. Uh, they could have. And as we've seen, they could have swept that aside and made the decision to keep people on the ground. That's not an easy decision. That's not an right one. There is risk that comes with that. I think there's a fair, a fair argument that can be made that there, there would have been more targeting of American troops and, uh, and other entities on the ground. And this could have become a, a much more protected fight again that would require more resources and brought us into something. So there's, there's no easy decisions uh, in, in any of this. And, um, and, uh, uh, so, you know, I, I think there's, I think there's blame enough to go around in, in all of this. Uh, and when, when we started our negotiations with the Taliban, uh, you know, we, we were, we, we were not perhaps as inclusive of the Afghan government in these processes. And this, of course, this created a problem with them right from the beginning. So we had uh, we had the United States and, and the Taliban talking. We didn't have the Afghan governments well integrated into that. And we didn't really have our allies very well integrated into that. So, you know, we act, and we made some unilateral decisions here in in both administrations that uh, really put uh, put our partners on, on on in really bad bad places here. Um, I, I would just, I, I mean, again, I, and, and, and I say all of this, and I, and I will tell you, I was a senior commander, and, uh, and I was in position to provide advice, and I, I thought that I, I was, I, I bear some of the responsibility for this, I, I certainly recognize that, and I, I think about it all the time, um, I, and so I'm, I'm not trying to shift my blame to, to anybody else, I, I think I do bear responsibility, as do, as do others that were in my position, and in similar positions, so we all bear some responsibility and how this turned out um, for our country. I, I ultimately, our interests weren't protected in this regard. I, 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 I would just say I, I, I do like the idea of, of, uh, of keeping a small force on the ground. I think this was an important thing to do. It could have given us more time with the Afghan government. It could have certainly bolstered the Afghan forces. I think, it, I think small forces matter. One, I would share one story with you from Iraq that I think is poignant here. When we left Iraq in 2011, we largely pulled out all of our Title X war fighting forces, lock, stock, and barrel. Everybody left. Everybody was across the border by, uh, by December 31st on, on 2011, and, and we were out. And we, we left, we did leave some forces on the ground. We left security uh, cooperation elements, and we left two special forces operational detachments on the ground, really a total of about 24 uh, uh, Green Berets on the ground that worked with the, with the Iraqi um, counterterrorism services. And they continued to work with them really all the way through 2014 when we returned for ISIS. And what that small element was able to do was able to hold that Iraqi counterterrorism service together. And when we actually rejoined the fight back in 2014, 2015 against ISIS, and we had to, we knew we had to get back into that, the, the bulk of the response eventually that we built around the Iraqi forces was done on the back of the Iraqi counterterrorism service, which we had stayed with and which had stayed coherent and had uh, and had conducted themselves with uh, with honor and nobility throughout the throughout a very different difficult uh, period when the rest of the Iraqi army and, and military essentially evaporated. They did not. They held very tight. And they became the core upon which the Iraqi military really was re rebuilt. So if you don't think that uh, that small commitments of U.S. troops on the ground can accomplish a lot, to me, that is exhibit A. And, uh, and, I, and I absolutely believe that that was a smart decision at the time and it, and it paid off when we, had to, when we found ourselves in a much more difficult position. So, you know, I, I, think we could have, I think we could have done this. I think that should have been our policy all along um, and that we were gonna we were kind of in it to win it and we were gonna stay with our Afghan partners that just neither of the, of the current administration and the administration that preceded it Neither, neither of our of our two commanders and chiefs, I think, believe that, and then I think they both believe we needed to depart uh, this country. And ultimately, they're they're the, they're the commanders and and chief, and that's the decisions they made. General, thank you. Here is a question from a a fellow West Point graduate. Uh, and here here is a question. Uh, he writes this, General. You spoke about how we had an opportunity to exit in 2011 after bin Laden was killed. 
Can you expand as to why we did not exit them? <clears throat> what was the problem that by that time we found bin Laden was, was, was it too late? Were we too entrenched in Afghanistan to have a graceful exit? Uh, I, you know, I think it's a, I think it's a really good question, and uh, I, I'm not sure I, I have the full answer on this. I think we, I think we, uh, I think we believe we could achieve something more here um, in Afghanistan, I, and I, and uh, and there was a, there was a reluctance on the part of the Afghan government, in addition to our government, to actually. Um, begin talks with the Taliban. Um, and of course, th throughout all of this, the Taliban was making use of Pakistan. Pakistan had become more problematic in this, uh, and they had sanctuary there. So, uh, and they were launching attacks. We, you know, during that period, we were still losing quite a few soldiers and Marines, um, airmen, sailors on the ground uh, that were conducting operations there. So uh, there, there, there was a real feeling that we needed to pour it on and, uh, and, uh, and, and finish the work that we had started against the Taliban. And I think that took the priority, frankly. And uh, rather than, uh, than kind of move uh, forward with that, with I think what is an opportunity, a milestone event here, and try to use that as a way to uh, to take a different approach. I think we just chose to do something else in in terms of this. And I think it was really focused on thinking we could achieve something 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 bigger. In General, thank you. Uh, your your video froze there briefly. Are you still with us, General? Roy, can you hear me? Uh, yes, I do, but uh, the sound, general sound is gone. It's been muted somehow. Hello, hello. Yes. Ah, uh, you're back, General. Okay. Right. Hey, th this is a last question before I hand it over to Roy uh, to, to finish. And this question uh, is not about Afghanistan, and it's from your friend and our fellow board member, uh, Al Berkeley. And here is a question. What are the big issues in Russia, Ukraine in the Russia, Ukraine war for the months to come? Uh, thanks, uh, thanks, Al. I think that's a, that's a great question. And, uh, you know, I, I think as I've been watching this now for 200 plus days um, uh, of, uh, of very vicious combat in this country, I think one of the things that I kind of continue to watch, and I think most military guys do, is they're, is they're looking for who has the momentum at the, at the present time. And I, and I do think uh, we, we have seen, we continue to see a change in momentum. I, I, I think actually uh, the Russians have regained some of the momentum with these very vicious infrastructure uh, attacks that they have been waging on, on, uh, on Ukrainian uh, energy and, and other uh, utility uh, uh, facilities across the country that have really uh, brought the fight back to the people. People. And uh, and uh, you know I, I don't know that this is necessarily a winning strategy for uh, for uh, for Russia. In fact, I don't think that it is. But it has certainly caused put the put the Ukrainians a little bit more on their back feet. Uh, as many of you will recall, just a few weeks ago we saw a lot of progress by the Ukrainians, and I in the in the east. I suspect some of that continues, although it's it's being eclipsed right now by the uh, these devastating infrastructure attacks that are that are taking place and so I, I think one of the things we should always be watching is who who has the momentum in this and how do we how, and and I think the challenge for the Ukrainians and for those of us that are supporting Ukrainians is how do we help the Ukrainians regain the initiative uh, and regain the momentum in the fight that they had just just a few weeks ago uh, in terms of this I mean I, I think uh, I think there's going to be a variety of other issues here it's it's November 8th, um, and in Europe, it's starting to get cold, just like it's starting to get cold here. And so the impact of uh, reduced energy sources is going to begin to have uh, perhaps having put more pressure on NATO 
partners and the populations of those countries to address the problems that they have and not necessarily the problems that uh, that uh, that Ukraine has. Uh, I think the United States has done a wonderful job of bringing our NATO partners and a variety of others around the world to, together to bring the right resources to um, to um, uh, to uh, to the Ukrainians, uh, to continuing to sustain that is going to be a challenge, I think, as we move forward. I mean, you've already heard some rhetoric, hopefully just election rhetoric here about that, about whether we can continue to do that or not. Um, uh, again, this, uh, this is, will be important for us in terms of how we follow through with our partners. So I think, you know, these are, these are the issues. And then, then of course, We've heard uh, Mr. Putin's, you know, saber rattling here about the use of nuclear weapons. Uh, you know, I, I think these are things that we always have to take, um, take, uh, uh, we can't take for granted. We have to take it seriously uh, and we have to make sure we're, we're staying focused on that. So, and, and I think here in the United States, we're continuing to send more resources in there. We're uh, draining some of our own stockpiles to, to make sure that they're going to, you know, the Ukrainians are firing at least a, uh, what I heard uh, about a week and a half ago, about 3,000 artillery rounds a day. That's what they're firing. And it's, it's more than double uh, for the Russians. I mean, this is an extraordinarily kinetic fight that we are seeing. Uh, and sustaining that is going to be very, very significant. And it comes at a cost. It comes at a cost for us. It comes at a cost for all of our partners. And so the ability to sustain that is going to be a, a big piece, particularly as we try to really focus on our on the real existential threat to us, which is China, and uh, move more resources and put more focus into that particular theater. So I think these are all going to be issues that we're going to uh, we're going to continue to deal with as we as we move forward. And I think you know the one thing we should be watching is who has the momentum in the fight and how do we how do we keep it with the uh, with the Ukrainians. General, thank you very much. Roy, over to you, sir. Yeah, so maybe I could do a follow-up on that point, uh, General, which is what in your mind would be a, 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 a good goal, a good uh, end state in Ukraine? Is it the complete departure of Russian forces from uh, the entire uh, the entirety of Ukraine? Is it a reversion to uh, uh, February 23rd of this year? Um, is, it, is it the ouster of, uh, the, uh, of the Russian leadership? Um, what, what do you think is, 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 a, well, is a good end goal? Yeah, I, I, yeah, I, I mean, I, I think uh, like many people, I think, uh, you know, obviously this is an illegal in, uh, invasion here of a, of a sovereign country. And, uh, and uh, I, 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 I would kind of align myself with Mr. Zelensky and the Ukrainian people who see this as expelling the, uh, the Russians from, uh, from their country and from the, you know, the confines of, uh, of, you know, what the, the political boundaries of, uh, of Ukraine. So I, I think that's the end state we have to move for. Whether that can be achieved or not, um, I, you know, I, I think is, a, is, another, is another thing, but I, I think that's definitely where they are right now. I, I, I don't, I don't I, I, it would be really, really difficult, I think, uh, to get the Ukrainians involved in some level of meaningful negotiations with the Russians, given what is happening uh, right now against, their, against, the, against these people. There's not much motivation for the Russians or for the Ukrainians to step into this. And this isn't something we can, we can negotiate for them. This has got to be done by them. We can certainly help enable that. But uh, I just don't think, I don't think we're there with, that, with this yet. And I, I think Mr. Putin's conduct has not been necessarily worthy of this. Not now, again, I, you know, in terms of a most desired insight, I, I mean, I think it would be great if somebody would put a bullet right between Mr. Putin's running lights there and, uh, and, and, maybe, uh, and maybe give us another opportunity here. Again, I'm not sure what comes in the wave of that. Uh, some of you probably saw the article uh, recently here on, on, uh, on the leader of the Wagner group. I mean, there are others around Putin that are just as bad and maybe even worse. So, you know, uh, getting rid of Putin is as, as desirable as that might, might be. Uh, again, if we don't know what comes behind that, uh, it could be just as bad. Uh, you know, this guy that is leading the, uh, the, the Wagner group that is, you know, perpetrating a lot of the atrocities, propping up a lot of the fighting right now, uh, and, uh, you know, kind of serves as a paramilitary 
you know, chain of command in the in the country, uh, um, you know, this this could even this could even be worse. So I, I, I'm afraid there's not a lot of good outcomes here. I think what we have to do is we have to we have to really enable the the Ukrainians to do the best job they can of of resecuring their borders. Are there any circumstances in which the United States uh, should become involved? For example, if the Russians use nuclear weapons, um, is that uh, a circumstance? Or do you have? Yeah, I, I realize it's a hypothetical, but yeah, more you know, hypothetical. I, I, I mean. Speaking as a private citizen, yeah, I think if somebody uses a nuclear weapon, I think we have to respond. I think I think this is that's a different that's a different situation. I mean, and 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 I and I don't I'm not one that subscribes to well, it's a tactical nuke or there is there's it's only nukes and and stepping to that level of force I think would mandate a response and at least that would be my expectation that we would we would respond to that um, and we just could we we cannot allow that to happen. Uh, the 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 example that that would set for others uh, Iranians. North Koreans, others here who uh, you know are pursuing these these same objectives, I think would uh, would would be horrible for mankind here, and uh, and really just uh, threaten the whole security global security environment in a way that uh, we might not recover from for a long time. A final question is to come back to Al Berkeley again. Uh, what is the, what are the hard questions you would want us to ask, or have we already asked? <laughs> Well, I think you all have done a pretty good, uh, pretty good job of asking questions, and I actually have been kind of monitoring the, 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 the questions and answers in the chat box there, and I, I am uh, really appreciative um, for uh, for all of that. You know, I think. Um, I think you know we're, we spent a lot of time talking about Afghanistan. We spent a little bit of time talking about Russia. I think the the one thing I think is important to think about is is this is this existential challenge that we have with China. Uh, this is I think really really important to do. One of the uh, one of the things that I am doing. Al knows this uh, with our with our with the business executives for national security. We are doing a lot of work on kind of helping. Working with government partners, kind of help imagine, um, you know, what what we would think of as the defense industrial base. In other words, how do we maintain our competitive edge against China going going forward? You know, we 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 have been the arsenal of democracy. Uh, we don't have the same production capacity that we had in the during the Cold War. Um, we have gone from you know somewhere around fifteen public shipyards uh, in the United States down to four right now. Uh, we have uh, uh, about 22, somewhere between 22 and 26 dry dock facilities uh, where we can we can maintain our uh, our U.S. Navy vessels. It's insufficient to need. We have a real serious challenge with maintenance of our ships and being able to sortie the uh, the ships that we need in the fleet uh, to continue to contribute to our deterrent effect here. Uh, we've got to harness technology here, so we have really got to be thinking about how we how we reimagine our uh, our uh, maintaining our competitive edge going forward because that's essentially what's at uh, what's at stake right here. Uh, China is moving in a direction where they are looking to replace us. They are looking to rewrite the rules of the road uh, that had been in place since the end of World War II and which have largely guided how, uh, how countries around the world interact. And uh, to me, how we address this is the really, really hard question for us right now. For the United States, in terms of that, I, I'm 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 gratified to see the national security strategy come out that really puts focus onto this. But as we have ta already talked about in this discussion, this is this is not just a job for the military. This is this is all hands on deck. And when I say that, I mean not just the diplomats and the military and the intelligence community, but the business community, uh, all civil society here has got to has got to grab onto this, and we have got to recognize what is at stake in this competition with China, and uh, and uh, we need to posture ourselves to to prevail, and uh, and we don't have a lot of time left to do that. Um, so to me, that's the hard question. That's the hard challenge that. That uh, that I think exists for us today, I, and I well, I'm tempted. To, I just have to ask you one question about uh, related to that. The the, the pivot to China uh, has been advocated by several administrations, uh, and it's being carried forth. But that means actually uh, the it seems like the departure from the Middle East 
Uh, does that make sense? Well, uh, no, it really doesn't. And, uh, and I think uh, pivot is not a good word here. And I think over time we've learned um, that that's not the right way. To, it doesn't translate well, man, because because what it does, is it feeds this feeling of abandonment in places like the Middle East and other other things like that. And 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 again, I I agree. We can we we could you know when I was a CENTCOM commander, I think at one point we had about eighty five thousand troops on the ground uh, from you know Afghanistan to Syria and north to south across the country. So we had a, we had a very significant commitment. We're certainly considerably uh, down from that now, as with the end of the war in Afghanistan and reduced commitments in Iraq and Syria and some other places there. So yeah, necessarily we are. Uh, but, you know, we are the United States of America and we can do multiple things at the same time. We do, we do, we do continue to have national interests, vital national interests in the Middle East. Um, frankly, you know, this is an area where, you know, 40, 40 percent or more of the daily global commerce travels through the waterways of the Middle East every day. Um, and, uh, you know, if you want to hold China uh, at risk, uh, we shouldn't lose the sight of the fact that 47% of their oil travels through the Straits of Hormuz every day. Um, and so, you know, this is, this is an area that's important to us. And we need to, we don't need to have tens of thousands of troops on the ground, but we need Need to have a sustainable presence of, of, uh, of military forces in the region to protect our interests, to bolster our partners, and to and uh, and the, and to preserve our influence, which is, for better or worse, has largely served us in a positive way for the last several decades. With all the setbacks. Yeah, exactly. Well, there's always going to be setbacks, but yeah. Hey, Roy, if if I could, I know we're, we're running really short on time here, but since the general mentioned China. Um, there are a number of nervous Nellies out there now about China. And to be honest with you, uh, I sort of downplayed the nervous Nellies until I saw the comments by Admiral Chaz Richard, the, the STRATCOM commander last week speaking. He apparently is quite concerned uh, that we are losing our military advantage vis-a-vis China. Uh, on a scale of one to 10, 10 meaning you are so scared. Where, where, where do you fall on that nervous Nelly's scale regarding the US vis-a-vis -vis China? Okay, I'm, I'm a pretty, I'm a pretty solid seven point five to eight on that. Uh, <laughs> I mean, no, I, I, I think I first of all, uh, you, you brought up uh, Admiral Chaz Richards, and you know he's a uh, submariner and a nuclear, you know, officer, and so, you know, I'm an Army Ranger, so we didn't necessarily travel in the same circles <laughs> while we were in service together there, but, but I will tell you something, I've got to know him, and I have immense respect for him, and uh, the job that he does every day and his knowledge and the professionalism with which he brings to you know his profession which is essentially you know the the, the strategic deterrent for the United States so I think this guy knows what he's talking about uh, and I think he is uh, he is he is a straight talker in terms of this and I think we should pay very close attention to this uh, I I um, again I, I I'm 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 cautious about painting our adversaries and making them all ten feet tall. China has benefited by our distraction in the Middle East, by our operations in the Middle East for several decades here. They have been a fast follower. They have ripped off uh, billions and trillions of dollars of IP from us. Uh, they are building, uh, they have got a centralized strategy. They are spending money like crazy right now. Uh, and they have got a level uh, unity of effort between their government and their industry that is producing capabilities that are very quickly catching up to ours. And, uh, and then they're, they're augmenting all of that with this Belt and Road Initiative, which is extending their reach around the world with the sole purpose of everything beginning and ending in Beijing. We should be very concerned about this, and we we should uh, we should make sure that we are doing the right things right now to maintain our competitive edge, to make sure we sustain our deterrent effect, and we should be doubling down on our partnerships around the globe here. That's that's one of our asymmetric advantages is our partnerships. Our our list of partners always has to be longer than China's, and it is. 
um, but we've got to, we can't take this for granted anymore. And we've got to, we've got to pay attention to this, to this particular challenge. Uh, General, I have Seven to, five. Yes. I want to thank you really for coming tonight, uh, for answering all of our questions, uh, for putting some questions to us. No, but uh, you, you've really uh, laid out uh, a much bigger uh, scene than just uh, Afghanistan. <clears throat> and, uh, I, and, I, and I think your, your common sense and your factual responses have been uh, really helpful for all of us. Uh, thank you. Thank you, thank you. so much. Thank you. It's been an honor to be with you and happy Veterans Day to, uh, to all of our veterans out there.